Hello again, everybody. Skip Perry welcoming you to a special night of Atlanta Braves baseball. Interleague play resumes tonight, and the Braves find themselves at historic Fenway Park, and not for the first time. Braves played here back in 1914 while their field was being remodeled. They'll play here for the first time since they left Boston many, many years ago. John Smoltz on the mound against Aaron Seeley, and a fellow who knows a lot about this ballpark and pitched here a lot is my partner, Don Sutton. Don, it's a unique place, huh? You're right, Skip. It's Fenway Park. And along with Wrigley Field and Yankee Stadium, probably one of the most talked about ballparks in the history of baseball. A lot going on for you here if you're a fan and if you're a player. Now, they have all the old traditions, the small sunken dugouts, very close to the playing field. They have the fan-friendly seating, everybody right on top of the playing surface, all the nooks and crannies. This is not a symmetrical ballpark. And out in right field, the bullpens are exposed. They're right out in the open. And, oh, yeah, there's the green monster, 310 feet down the left field line, one of the most famous walls in the history of the world, maybe right up there along with the Great Wall of China and the Berlin Wall. Now, if you're standing at home plate, you're a right-handed hitter, awfully exciting to fly open and take a shot at that. But if you're 60 feet, 6 inches away from home plate and you look over your right shoulder, you tend to grip this thing just a little bit tighter. All of the new ballparks, they're trying to go back to the old nostalgia, all the old traditional things, and they're doing it well. But there's one thing they will never replicate. That's the green monster. And I guarantee you, right out there behind the shortstop, that green monster is going to add a little spice to this weekend series before we're all through. Don't go away. We're going to take a timeout. When we come back, we've got the starting lineups for you. Game one of the series against the Boston Red Sox. Special tonight, Atlanta Braves and Boston Red Sox tonight on TBS. Braves baseball on the Superstation. Jones will hit third. Fred McGriff is the cleanup hitter. Ryan Fusco will be in left field. Andrew Jones to play right. That's sixth. Javier Lopez is going to catch. Greg Colburn is a designated hitter. Remember, those American League rules are in effect when we play in American League City. And Jeff Blauser will complete Bobby Cox's batting order. The defense for the Boston Red Sox. Cordero in left, Bragg in center. It's O'Leary in right. Benjamin is at third. Georgia Tech product Nomar Garcia Parra is at shortstop. Fry and Vaughn complete the infield. Hatterberg behind the plate and on the mound, a right-hander. His name is Aaron Seeley. You see what he has done for the season. The earned run average up around six. But his last eight starts, he has had some real struggles, giving up almost nine runs a ball game. This will be his 28th start. The league is hitting 286 against Aaron Seeley. The umpiring crew for game one of the series. Here's how they'll line up. It's Brian Onora behind the plate. Jim Joyce at first. Good guy Dale Ford will be at second. And Martin Foster, that completes your umpiring order. Well, it is uh, a nostalgic ballpark. And it is a return of the Braves back to where they originally started. And so Skip to get that event in perspective and to kind of give us a look at the old time uniforms. The Braves and the Red Sox are going back to the. I don't think they're flannels. They just look like that era. Yeah. I, uh... I don't really understand why they're doing that, but if it makes them happy, I guess it's fine. Uh, these are the Atlanta Braves, no matter what they think here. And Kenny Lofton will lead it off. Lofton at 350 with five homers, 43 RBI. He's one of the few Braves who has participated against Aaron Seeley, and he's done well against him, seven out of 16. We are underway. Stay right. 0 and 1 the count. This is as close to heaven as I'm likely to get. They got us up here pretty high in the press box in Fenway. Strike two call. So Lofton quickly in the hole. Keith Lockhart is on deck. Greg Colburn, the DH tonight. Just missed inside. A ball and two strikes. They've been really concerned about Seeley. He's been getting hit around, getting behind in the count, and giving up a lot of long balls. Pop foul back and out of play. League hitting 286 against him, 22 homers. 
The Braves back in 1914 and until July of 1915 called Fenway Park home until Braves Field was constructed on the Charles River. And the team played there through 52. The pitch. Strike three called inside corner. Lofton can't believe it. And we're off and running in the American League City. One up. I think that's probably a strike Kenny Lofton wasn't used to seeing when he was in the American League. Normally, and if you talk to people around baseball, they tell you that the American League strike zone a little bit smaller, and you see a lot more three ball, two strikes, two ball, no strike counts than you do in the National League. Keith Lockhart hitting 252. He's two out of seven against Sealy. Low, one ball, no strikes. We're just underway from Boston. It's funny how a ballpark, you see it on TV so many times, and then you get there and it's nothing like you imagined it would be. TV doesn't do this place justice. Tap fouled on the first baseline. The Red Sox, 67 and 67 for the year. Jimmy Williams has done a good job for them. Chipper Jones waits on deck. Two and two, low and inside. Yeah, this looks like a ballpark that you might find on the back lot of a movie set that they built and put mm -hmm. together just to show you how old time baseball was played. Curve hits sharply to move on. He boots it. He recovers and he steps on the bag in time. Two up. Moe's so big that ball was afraid to move too far away from him, so he was able to pick it up and step on the bag. Yeah, a lot of flannels had to give their lives for this uniform for Mo Vaughn, but he did keep it in front of him, and his pitcher does thank him that he didn't have to take that throw with his back to the runner and cover first. Chipper hitting 303, 18 homers, 101 RBI. In right field, if you can hit it right down the line, it's a chip shot. But, brother, it gets out there in a hurry. Hit hard. Vaughn, good play. Knocks it down, picks it up. Pitcher covers. Inning over. One, two, three, nothing doing. Bottom of the first, no score. Red Sox will bat against the Braves. Jimmy Williams lined up card has no Mark Garcia Parra leading it off. Jeff Pride about second. Move on to third place hitter. Designated hitter Reggie Jefferson. What a year he is having. Will Cordero to bat field. Troy O'Leary in the sixth spot. Scott Hatterberg is the catcher batting seventh. Mike Benjamin, former National Leaguer in the eighth spot. And Darren Bragg will complete the batting order. Braves defense looks like this. Andrew Jones in, in right. Lofton in center. Clusco in left. McGriff, Lockhart, Blauser, and Chipper Jones from first to third. Javi Lopez is behind the plate. And John Smoltz will be making his 30th start. Here are John's numbers, 12 and 10, a 298 earned run average. They're hitting 246 against him, five more strikeouts, and he'll have 200 for the year. John has allowed 17 homers, and he has a pair of shutouts. And the toast of the town, Nomar Garcia Parra, the former Georgia Tech All-America, leads it off. He's hit safely in an American League rookie record, 29 straight. During that streak, he's hitting 380. Third longest Red Sox streak ever. Don DiMaggio had 34 back in 49, and Tris Speaker 30 in 1912. Schmoltz into the line, his first pitch. High fly ball into right field. That's playable. Andrew Jones is there. I think that's Andrew out there. Wow. These uniforms. Guys don't look like they normally look. One away. You're also going to find this is a ballpark where there are a lot of shadows, especially in left, left center, and then right in the middle of right field, about, uh, oh, 20 feet to Andrew Jones's right. There's a dark, shadowy area there. 68 degrees at game time here tonight. 
A sellout crowd. This one's been sold out for a long time. Smoltz into the wine. Jeff Fry as the batter. He's out of Oakland, California, and he takes a strike. 0 oh, and 1, the count. The Ward sisters from Georgia, Florida, and Nantucket are here. Five of the six, and they're all talking about number six, Alice, who couldn't make it to the game tonight. They ask for help, no swing. And the count goes to one and one. Smoltz ready to go to work. Up and in on him, and he swung and missed. Fry, a late addition to the lineup. John Valentin was scratched. Minor injury. A ball and two strikes. Strike three called about a foot outside, it looked like. Fry has a word for the home plate umpire, Brian O'Nora. Two are out. Early on, we've already seen a National League type strike zone. And the Boston Red Sox better get ready and see a different style of pitching. A lot of the American League pitchers go 2 and 0, 3 and 1, 3 and 2, trying to throw pitches that are either swung at and missed, not fouled away. But a lot of the National League style of pitching is they expect to get an out on a pitch, not just a strike on it. More aggressive. The shift is on for Atlanta as Mo Vaughn comes to the plate, hitting 325. 28 homers, 80 RBIs. Chipper Jones is playing at the shortstop position. Jeff Blauser on the second base side of the bag. Mo Vaughn has power to left center field in the air. Hardly ever hits it that way on the ground. Downstairs, a ball and a strike. They haven't played straight away in the outfield. Remember uh, Mark McGuire, the book on Mark McGuire is you can throw him fastballs if you have good velocity and you keep it a right about the letters. Almost the same for Mo Vaughn. You can go upstairs, but you better have something on it. Check swing strike. It's one and two. Slider down and in on. I don't know if that uniform's a good look for Mo or not. I think he and Hoss Cartwright both would have looked good in it. A one two foul back count stays the same. Two out nobody on. Up and away two balls two strikes. They say it's 310 down the left field line. I don't know if that's. <laughs> it's been measured many times and found to come up short. So does Vaughn on another slider up and in, and the inning is over at the end of one. No score in the ball game. Here, I would think that for both Fred and Ryan Klesko, looking in the left field would be an invitation to get a little bit closer. There's a drive into deep right field. Back goes O'Leary to the track. It's gone. Fred McGriff hit that baby a long way, about 375 feet into deep right field. That is the 23rd home run surrendered by Seeley, and Atlanta leads one to nothing. And it's more the same for Aaron Seeley. Sometimes when we talk about control problems, people think you're walking a ton of people. Control problems can also be missing in the heart of the strike zone. Now, he had made a good pitch on the first one, wants this one to go down and away, but that's off speed and right down the middle. And Fred had closed up. But the swing made it very easy then just to roll it over and get all of that one. Ryan Klesko stands in. Strike call outside corner, 0 and 1. Braves break on top here. Andrew Jones is on deck. Then Javi Lopez. A reminder, we use the designated hitter here. So John Smoltz and Aaron Seeley will not swing the bat. Two 
Two strikes. Not that big a deal. A Not that big a deal to Aaron Seeley, but Smoltz is probably too. We'll get over it. Busco swings late, strikes out, asks whether or not the pitch is a strike. He gets an affirmative answer from the home plate umpire, Brian Onora. Second strike out for Seeley, first out of the inning. Here's Andrew. Number 25, the right fielder, Andrew Jones. his foot it rolls into fair territory on one the count. Onora puts a new ball into play. Kevin Millwood will pitch for the Braves tomorrow. He's not activated yet but he's going to pitch. And when he is activated somebody has to go. At least for a couple of days. Millwood's been with the club a few days. He wanted to get his workout prior to pitching in up here and did. Andrew missed a curveball by foot. That's Seeley's best pitch to my way of thinking. A big breaking curveball. Our next telecast will be Monday night against the Tigers from Atlanta. Almost hit him inside. No telling where the open will be done Monday. Two and two. Be surprised if Andrew got another fastball here. Curveball ball got him. Jones out on strikes two in a row after the McGriff homer. Three strikeouts in the game for Seeley. Here's Javi Lopez. He's been a red hot hitter. He's at 293 now with 21 homers. 58 RBI. Number eight. The catcher. Bobby Lopez. Greg Colburn moves on deck. Another curveball. Gets you two ways on that curveball, yeah. doesn't he? He's got pretty good break on it. Some got big break, but he also backs the speed off his fastball. Got to be a good 12, 15 miles an hour. Hesitation there, but a strike is called. And it's 0 2. Fastball hit right back where it came from. Seeley to first, and the inning is over. But the Braves break out on top on a Fred McGriff homer, the only hit of the inning. No airs, nobody left. Bottom half of the second inning. Braves won, both shots, nothing. Club is prohibited. Reggie Jefferson leads off the second inning. The wind and the pitch from Smoltz. Swung a chopper up the middle. Lockhart to his right field. Throws the first. One pitch, one out in the bottom of the second. You look out in the right center field area and you see the bullpens of the two teams. That's an area called Williamsburg. They put those bullpens there in 1940 to try to help Ted Williams hit home runs. It was even longer out there, 23 feet longer until that time. So if you ever hear him talking about Williamsburg, that's what they're talking about. As far as Boston baseball is concerned. And that's the Thumper's number, number nine, retired here. Will Cordero is the batter. He's going through tough times with his personal problems. Gets booed every time he moves here. Oh, no one the count. A ball and a strike. The one one delivery. I pop foul back. And it will reach the seats. How they gave it a look but has no chance. A lot of times when you're playing a ball club you you have the scouting report what a pitcher throws but you try to do a comparison and I would guess what they would say for John Smoltz is you got to feel like you're facing Roger Clemens only with a better breaking ball. Mm -hmm. 
right off the end of the bat. I know at least one groundskeeper stays in shape here. He has to clamber up that ladder out in deep left center every night. Go up there and get all the balls that are hit over the green monster into the netting during batting practice. Started to go, did not swing. Two balls, two strikes. Phillies in Detroit scoreless after an inning. In Detroit. There's, there's that letter. I'm trying to keep Danny Reagan on his toes tonight as we look around this ballpark. He's our director, Glenn Diamond, our producer this evening. Outside, three and two, and Howard Feinberg produced our outside the ballpark footage here this evening. Three balls, two strikes. Lined on one hop to Blouser, good play. Two down. This is a kick for a lot of the Braves players to have grown up in the National League, like Blouser, to get to play in this ballpark. And a guy who's enjoying coming in here the most is the man right there on the right. That's Tom Glavin because he'll right fielder, get to start here. He's Troy a O'Leary. Boston Red Sox fan nearby. Close enough to see a lot of games. And you know it's got to be a thrill for him. Smoltz into the wine. Delivery. A little bit low. One ball, no strikes. Two out, nobody on. Braves on top, one nothing. Fred McGriff, a long homer to right. There's a strike right in there. O'Leary is a hot hitter. He's a 323 with 13 homers, 69 runs driven in. Smoltz has great stuff in the early going. With all four of his pitches, his fastball, his curveball, his slider, and his forkball. Which is what the last pitch was. Very quiet crowd here. He threw it right by him. A high fastball out of the strike zone. John records his third strikeout of the night. He has set down six in a row. We have completed two. It's one nothing Atlanta. And 16 guys were in fair territory. The wind and the pitch. Strike. All that is true, but you've missed the key point. I wish you had been pitching for on that date. A seagull dropped a three-pound smelt on the mound while Ellis Kinder of the St. Louis Browns was pitching. Grand ball, deep shot. Garcia Parra, look at that throw. Got him. One out, nice tag by Vaughn. Good play all the way around. One down. Well, so much has been made about his hitting. Overlooked, the fact is that Garcia Parra is a good defensive shortstop. Has to go a long way. Gets a lot on an off-balance throw. Bo Vaughn helps him on this end. Comes to the ball and makes the tag. And you're right. A good play on both ends. Here's Jeff Blouser. And there have been some performances that I've, I have had on the mound that would have been like a nine-pound smelt. Thing. <laughs> I know I've seen you have some that smelt, but not many. <laughs> Blouser at 308. Our buddy Bob Rathbun <laughs> gave me this little note about Fenway Park. There's some great stuff in here. <laughs> Sharply hit on one hop to fry. Blouser is fried, two down. And Kenny lost in the batter. Will anything exciting happen on August the 29th? Not yet. Well, home run by Fred McGriff, about 380 feet. We talked at the open about the irregularities here and uh, how it's not a symmetrical ballpark. What are the dimensions for this ballpark? I don't see that it's any of your business. 310 to right, or rather to left. They I say. know them, Clifford Earl. Tell the people. 302 to right, 380 into right center, 420 into deep right center, 379 into deep left center. And they say 310 down the left field line, but nobody believes it. 
Lofton takes a strength. It's 0 and 1. And you really don't get the perspective for that wall. You know, you can come out here to the ball game and you, you walk around and you look and you see, you know what's there, you know it's big, and you know it's close. Base hit right field, Lofton. A two out single. But you don't know how close it looks and appears until you stand on the mound. It looks like it's right behind the shortstop. You liked pitching here, though, didn't you? I really did enjoy pitching Number here. One. They have always the had one of the best tailored mounds in the American hard. League. And there is a perspective here that convinces you that the, that the plate is a lot closer than it really is. It's just a very comfortable place. And for the most part, Boston had right-handed hitters who wanted to stand right on top of the plate and try to yank the ball into the net up over the Green Monster so you could pitch inside. It was just a comfortable place to play. Lofton edges away with two out. Lockhart takes high, one ball, no strikes. We will not televise tomorrow, nor will we televise Sunday. We'll be back with you Monday night from Turner Field when the Detroit Tigers come to call. Seeley looks lost and back. Pitchers have been ahead of the hitter so far. Lofton scrambles back. And Griff's homer. The only hit of the game other than Lofton's single, which just occurred. You know, Don, they used to have bluegrass here in left field. Really? But they removed that in 1967, and it is now the grass in the yard of former left fielder Carl Spencer. I bet he got a deal on it. Oh, sure. We're talking about the comfortable atmosphere playing here. There are some things about it that are rather strict. Now, Helen at the switchboard, if you want to call from the outside and get one of the locker rooms, forget it. If you're in one of the locker rooms and you want to call out, forget it. You could get to the Pentagon easier. <laughs> she guards that switchboard with her life. Fastball outside. And don't come here early either when you're playing, thinking you're going to take a little walk around out there. Because I don't know his complete name, but Mooney is the groundskeeper here, and he guards his turf. They some say with cannons. Well, he may guard it, but it looks off. Sort of chewed up. You don't go out there prior to batting practice without Mooney's permission. They keep it, they keep it covered and. That's because the smelts keep falling on this guy. Nine pound smell. Just think how big that seagull is. No, it was a three pound smell. Still think how big that seagull is. That's not listed here. <laughs> Tom A. Yawkey and his wife, Jean R. Yawkey's initials appear in Morse code in two vertical stripes on the scoreboard and left. There's the strike. It's three and one. Just to the left of the numbers out there on the scoreboard, they have the numbers of the pitchers, and uh, to the left of, right there, you will see it. The left of the numbers there, and then slightly to the right, to the left of that set of numbers. The stretch. There goes Lofton. Pitch is outside. He walked in. Two on, two out. Seeley issues the game's first walk. And Joe Kerrigan, the pitching coach, is on his way to the mound for a word with his pitcher. Scott Hattieberg, the catcher, also to the mound. And Chipper Jones will have a chance to do some two-out damage here. Well, he came with a plan and some points to be made, too, because uh, that wasn't one of those how-do-you-feel conversations. Joe Kerrigan has come out and laid down some definite expectations, pointing, making a point with his hands. Now he departs. Number 10, the third baseman. Joe Kerrigan Chipper was a pitching coach Jones. that Jimmy Williams inherited, but he inherited one with a good reputation. He's got Grady Little on his bench. Former Braves coach and Herm Sturrett, who used to be the Braves pitching coaches with the Red Sox as well. Two out, two on the pitch. Strong and missed. He was out in front. Good change up, good motion, good long arm action, which adds to the deception. Kill the speed on it, got movement on it, and put it in a good location. Hard to have a change up go wrong with those three things.
0 and 1 the count. The runners lead the pitch. Downstairs. It's even now a ball and a strike. A cool night in Boston. It rained all day here, but it's supposed to clear out and be beautiful over the weekend. Steve Rank right in there. He's in the hole one and two. Our partner Joe Simpson has a family up here with him. Wife Kathy, daughter Meg, son Gabe. Gabe and Dad in the booth next door with Pete Van Weeren. Yeah, you know, I think they're touring some of the Ivy League campuses here. Who are yeah, Harvard and Yale. There go the runners inside throw to third. Oh, they caught him up. Lofton is cut down again, and they take the bat out of Chipper Jones' hand. Kenny is caught for the 19th time this year. He's stolen 21 bases. So, one hit, no runs, no errors, one left. We go to the bottom of the third, 1 nothing Atlanta. Now, sports has a new address. Smoltz delivers. Started to go, hold up. Full count now, three and two. This is really a neat city to travel to. Fly ball down that left field line, but Kerbin foul. Well, it still has a lot of the in-town neighborhoods. And you can go where there are the little corner taverns, little corner restaurants. Why you see a lot of people walking to the ballpark here? I was talking more about stuff like Paul Revere. Other stuff like that. Well, don't let me interrupt your show. He walked it. So there's the first base runner of the night. We don't talk about taverns on television, do we? <laughs> if it's a part of the neighborhood. Number 20. Here's Mike part Benjamin. Of the, the third baseman, Mike Benjamin. Benjamin, we've seen around before. Used to be with the Giants, among others, in the National League. He's hitting 260, two out of eight in his career against John Smoltz. Tying run at first, nobody out. A strike to Benjamin, it's 0 and 1. center field there's the first hit Lofton up with it and runners at first and second in the lower end of the order does some damage against Smoltz two on nobody out and Darren Bragg is the batter Bragg hitting 263 nine, number 56 the center fielder Darren Bragg Bragg out of Westbury Connecticut lives now in Phoenix Came up with the Seattle Mariners, came over to Boston in the middle of last season. So another guy who spent some time at Georgia Tech. And played in the Goodwill Games as well back in 1990. He didn't have to have as many credentials as you and I did, though, no, did he? I don't think so. <laughs> Probably didn't get as many sports coats either. Oh, and won the count. Fouled it back. He's in the hole, 0 and 2. No more Garcia Para is next. Boy, I wish Rams would have signed him. What a player he's going to be. At Georgia Tech, he was a pretty good hitter and an outstanding defensive shortstop. Now he's still an outstanding defensive shortstop, but an offensive force. Boy, he got some nice compliments in one of the papers here today from Dom DiMaggio, too. Got him. Bragg is out of there. That's four strikeouts. That is three strikes, isn't it? 
think it's only two. I guess so. The board had two up there. My mistake. There's another Georgia Tech graduate in the organization that might get called up. Jason Baratek. He'd have been in the big leagues two years ago. Yeah, if he'd have signed right away. Pretty close, but hey, get up, Randy. no call. Two and two. The outfield plays Bragg straight away. I think the Red Sox have a little bit of an advantage here in a couple of respects. Number one, it's a difficult ballpark to play in if you haven't played here before. Full count now, three and two. Because of the angles in the outfield and the like. And number two, Jimmy Williams knows just about everything there is to know about our ball club because he was an integral part of it. And Bobby Cox knows very little about his team because Bobby hasn't been in the American League for several years. Best thing you can do as a pitcher if you come in here though is not to let the ballpark become a part of what you do. If you pitch well and you make your pitches you can win in any ballpark. Not running got it. Well I was right all along one of one away fourth strikeout for Smokes. Got him to chase a couple of sliders down and in, and with two strikes, came right back with one there, put it in a good spot. See, it looks like a good pitch to hit for a left-hander till you pull the trigger, then it goes right down under the swing. Darcy Parra also, along with his 25 homers, has 10 triples, and that's most by a Red Sox in a season since Ted Williams hit 11 in. 1939. Foul back. 0 1. Actually, if you run up and down his stats, it's kind of hard to find one where he isn't leading all the rookies, only in stolen bases, but to get 20 and double figures in that. Look at some of those, he is actually tops in all of the players, like hits, like triples, and like runs scored with 107. That's an impressive list of credentials right there. Through the fastball right by him, strength against strength. 0 and 2. Jeff Fry is on deck. I see a far fly to right his first time. Little chopper passed him out. Blouser misplays it. It's a hit for Garcia Parra. He's hit in 30 straight games. Jeff was breaking toward the bag. I think he thought Smoltz was going to get to that ball. And John did not. And the bases are loaded with one out. And there's no question about it. Good pitch by Smoltz. Right about there, he thinks Smoltz has it. You're right. But by the time he retracted, very alertly did not make the throw. Everybody on the move. The only guy who could have made the play would have been Blouser, but he had no chance once he had the back track. Here's Jeff Fry, a strikeout victim his first time. That hit uh, ties Garcia Parra for second on the all-time Red Sox list with 30. Chris Speaker had that number way back in 1912. Don DiMaggio. 34 in 1949. He is now four games shy of the major league rookie record of 34 set by Benito Santiago. Serious trouble here. Two and zero. The count. Got to throw a strike on this pitch. Bases loaded. One out. I'll tell you another reason Blouser is breaking towards second because if Smoltz does handle it, there's a pretty good chance you got the double play. And they were shading Garcia Parra a little bit to the right side, so Blouser would have been the one covering on the comebacker to the pitcher. Three balls, no strikes. A walk means a run. Javi Lopez gets a new baseball for Smoltz. John returns to the mound upset with himself. 
Bases loaded, one out, and a 3 0 count on Jeff Fry, who was just in, inserted in the lineup about 15 minutes before game time. Smoltz calls time to tie a shoe. There's some artillery in up and down this lineup. They're hitting 299 as a team, so it doesn't really matter where you go in the lineup, and with the designated hitter, you don't have that eighth place hitter you can pitch around and the ninth place hitter that most of the time it's a sure out. There's a strike right through there. It's three and one. He was taking all the way, and he may be again. Let's see. Red Sox this year, six and three against the National League. Braves are four and five against the Americans. Fly ball down the right field line, twisting and foul, and out of play. That's a little pop fly, but it's close to being a home run right down that line. And that sure is a good pitch, three and one. That's actually a good pitch on any account. There's what you were talking about. Right into that corner, you can see the wall juts out quickly. So if you're 10 feet from the foul line, you got to hit it almost 380. But right into that corner, 300 feet will get you a home run. So a payoff pitch here. Mo Vaughn waits on deck. Bases loaded, one out, bottom of the third, one nothing Atlanta. The three two. Swung and line, center field, on comes Lofton, a sliding catch, and nobody can score. It's a bad base yes. running at third base. Because you got no place to go, and what you're taught from day one in Little League is when you're at third and the ball less than two outs and the ball is hit in the air, go back to the bag. Because if it's you're going to score anyway, so you should be standing on the bag right there. You're going to score anyway if it drops in. And now if you're down the line, you've got no chance of scoring. If you go back and tack, that is a break in a, for the Braves and an offensive mental lap. You can see his frustration. And a heck of a play by Kenny Lofton, too. That ball was really sucked. Well, he's not out of the woods yet, but he's got a chance to be. Vaughn out of the batter's box. A beach ball has landed on the field and left. That's a tradition that should have stayed in Los Angeles. It's a tradition that should have never started. But once it started. Smoltz ready to go to work. So is Mo Vaughn. Low into the dirt. Javi blocked it. One ball, no strikes. Vaughn, a strikeout victim his first time. He strikes out a lot, but another thing he does a lot is hit the ball out of the ballpark 28 times this year, 80 RBI. Everybody in the league, you know he's an upper cutter. He knows he's an upper cutter, but he gets enough pitches to handle it. It really doesn't matter. Did he go? Yes. They make the call at third base. Vaughn didn't like it. Martin Foster, the third base umpire. He can do a little umpiring there, and Ooh. I think I might have to agree with Bo Vaughn there. Thank you. A ball and a strike. Good slider down in on his hand. So John is out in front, but he's got a tough hombre up there now. One and two, the count. Patty Berg is running at third, Benjamin at second, Garcia Parra at first. Good speed on the back end where you like to have it in case there's a ball hit in the gap. Downstairs, it's two and two. There are two out. The bases are full of Red Sox. Gone out of the 
box takes a little time now gets himself back in there. Smoltz gets the Lopez sign. This is the pitch he wants to do business on. And he does and the inning is over again. It was the slider down and in and that's five strikeouts for Smoltz and the Braves get out of a mess in the third two hits no runs no errors three left. Three innings have gone by and the Braves enjoy a one nothing lead. A game winning home run in the 11th inning and it makes our Pearl Vision best looking player of the week. Chipper Jones was at the plate when Lofton was thrown out at third so he leads off the fourth. And takes a strike on the outside corner that strike out of Mo Vaughn to end the third inning. The 200th of the year for John Smoltz. That's four times in his career that he has struck out 200 or more and that is a Braves franchise record. Fly ball into center field pretty well hit pretty well hit. But Bragg is back there on the track and he's got it one out. So the first one is gone in the fourth. And here's Fred who gave the Braves their lead with a long home run to right back in the second inning. See, that's another thing this part does to you. That's a fly ball to left center field that in most places is just a routine out. But here, it's 379 into that corner, so anything 380 is going to be off the wall. So, and in the bat, looper really could be trouble in that area. Strike call to Fred. His home run, the difference in the game. It's 1 0. Ricochets back downstairs. Well, we're only in the fourth inning, but the Sealy that we have watched pitch certainly doesn't fit the numbers that you know on the stat sheet. Weak ground ball to second. Fry has it. Two down. And Ryan Klusko, the batter, a strikeout victim his first time. 92 members of the Braves 400 club. It's almost a quarter of them. Uh, float up here to Boston. Number 18. Root for the Braves. The left fielder. Our marketing director Wayne Long is here as well. And Larry Cancro, formerly of the Braves organization, now the marketing director here in Boston. Dropped by to say hello before the game. Wants to be remembered to as many friends in Atlanta. 0 and 1 to Clusco. But I guess what do they have here? The Bo Sox Club here at our Pete Van Ruren was there. Pete and Ernie both were there today. Mickey McDermott with his feature. Speaker right here was very good. High drive into left center field. That ball is tagged off the base of the wall. There'll be a play at second. He is safe. A double for Klesko. Bragg played that ball beautifully off the wall, made a close play on it. Well, there's where the familiarity with the park. Uh, comes into play. That's 378 feet right at the base of the wall. Number That's 25. normally a routine five Number ball in most right. places. But when he and sees it's going to hit off Jones. the wall, look at that. He backed away from the wall, waited, played the carom perfectly. And if his throw is on the bag, Ryan Klesko is out. It was just far enough away to give him a sliding double. So Andrew Jones, also a strikeout victim, his first time as the batter. Runner in scoring position, two out. Line out of music man, you got to know the territory. If you're going to play out, yeah. Meredith Wilson, yeah, yeah. yeah sure. If you're going to play the outfield here, you got to know the territory. That's one of the tunes out of the music man, 76 trombones, the Wells Fargo wagon. Well, neither one of those would do you a whole lot of good at thinning. Pick a little, talk a little. That That's might some, help. Yeah. Stretch. The 1 1 pitch. Broken bat, grounder to short. Or rather, the third, and the inning is over. I was watching Pusco dance out of the way of the bat at shortstop. One hit, no runs, no errors, one left. We go to the bottom half of the fourth inning. 1 0 Atlanta. September 21st, 1952. Think about it. We'll give you the answer in a little while. Reggie Jefferson hits the first pitch rather well into center. Lost him back a few steps. Puts it away. One out. 
Boy, look at these American League umpires. Hustle. Dale Ford was out in deep center field if there would have been any question about the play. Number 12, Martin Foster had raced to cover second if there was a play there. And the plate umpire, Brian Onora, was standing at third base in case there was a play there. And if, it, and if it had gotten carried away, then Jim Joyce would have rotated the home plate. That's fun to watch. Will Cordero, the batter, he gets booed here because of his problems with his wife. He has turned down a plea bargain that would have guaranteed him no jail time. High pop on the infield. Blouser going out. Cusco coming in. Lockhart's there, too. They collide. Blouser makes the catch. Let's see if everybody's all right. They are. You see there, perhaps, the unfamiliarity. Keith has played very little second base for Atlanta. This could have been a disaster. Yeah, you you have an idea. Like if Mark Lemke had been there, he's familiar with Jeff Blouser. They probably have a better Number idea of how far each of them will roam. If you're Keith Roy Locker, what you want to do is make sure somebody gets to it. And apparently nobody there was yelling because the center fielder, Kenny Lockett, had a shot at it, too. Troy O'Leary, the batter. A little bit outside. One ball, no strikes. Monday night, the much improved Detroit Tigers come to town. Outside. 2 0. In the second, Florida and Toronto are scoreless. Detroit 1 0 over the Phillies in the fourth. Cubs 1 0 over Cleveland in the fourth. Montreal and the Yankees scoreless in the second. And the Mets 1 0 over Baltimore in the second. 3 and 0 on the count here. Smoltz has a little cup top of himself. And now climbs back up on the mound. There's a the strength. It's 3 and 1. Looks like there's an oil spill or something right in front of the pitcher's mound. I wonder what that is. Also looks like it could be new side. 3 and 2. Make it a little bit darker than the other. Troy O'Leary, uh, interesting case. You have to wonder. What was going on? He came up with Milwaukee at 293, then he was hit 273. Next thing you know, he's on waivers, and the Red Sox got him on waivers. So here's a guy who was about 290 for two stops up in the big league level and on the waiver wire. 13 homers, 69 RBIs, a 323 average coming into the game. And he may have found a park. You hear sometimes there are horses for courses. Well, he may have found a park that suited for him because in about 200 ball games, Got himself a 325 batting average. People keep throwing beach balls out of the bleachers in there right center field. There used to be one of those uh, sports bits that they played all the time that showed Bob Stanley beating up one of those in the bullpen with the rake. And it must have run for 10 years before they decided to pull it. Beating up one of the beach balls? Yep. Would have been better advised to take a shot at the people who threw it. Lofton will handle this one, I hope. He does, and the inning is over. One, two, three, nothing doing. So staggering in the third. Smoltz rebounds in the fourth. We move on to the top of another fifth. It's one nothing at left. Did you say Brooklyn Dodgers? Charlie Grimm was the manager. He Number replaced eight. Tommy Holmes on May 31st of that year. Tommy you wonder why they Lopez. left their attendance for the whole year. 281,000 here. Yeah, they averaged 4,000 a game. I believe that's Smitty's mind. He stands the pitch inside. One ball, no strikes. Tim Smith, one of our fine cameramen. His brother, Tom, used to be one of our directors. She's up here to visit her son and watch some baseball. Little chopper toward third, an easy play for five. One out. Let's take a look at some scores on our Office Depot scoreboard. Philadelphia trails Detroit two to one. The Cubs struck first against Cleveland. That's still holding up. Montreal is at Yankee Stadium and trails. The Mets have taken on Baltimore, leading three to nothing. Florida, Toronto, no score, good pitching there. And elsewhere, Houston over the White Sox, one to nothing. Minnesota. Hosting Cincinnati, nothing doing bottom of the first. 
And you're up to date on our Office Depot scoreboard. Colburn swings and misses. It's 0 and 1. All the rest of the activity either just now getting underway or coming up a little bit later on. Mike Benjamin's a third. I think I said Fry made that play. It was Benjamin. He makes this one too in foul territory. There's a familiar face, Steve Avery, who will pitch here Sunday. Yeah, there are a lot of ties when the Braves come in here. Avery, Jimmy Williams, uh, Grady Little, Grady Little, uh, Nomar Garcia Parra from Georgia Tech, and the fact that this was the original home of the Braves. One and two, the count on Greg Colbrin. Little chopper to third. Benjamin has this one. And the inning has two outs. Jimmy Williams always popular when he was with the Braves, and the Braves players didn't waste any time finding him as soon as they got to the park. Jeff Clouser. Even some of them that didn't get to spend a whole lot of time with him, like Danny Batista. Here's Jeff Bowser, low and away, one ball, no strikes. Two balls, no strikes. Griff's leadoff homer in the second is the difference in the game. All the other base runners have been with two out. As is this one. And Kenny Lofton, the batter. Seeley's second walk of the game. For a guy who was given up four, a little over four per nine innings. Number seven, the center fielder. Kenny Lofton. Kenny Lofton has singled and struck out. 1 3 0 for the Braves, 0 2 0 for the Bow Sox, as they are called here. Renner at first, two down. Bowser edges away. He's three out of four in the Stolen Base Department. And he and Javi Lopez and Mark Lemke, the three of them probably draw more throws over there than Chipper Jones and Kenny Lofton combined. Strange, isn't it? Lofton didn't like that one either. By the way, a lot of the players were listening last night when we were discussing my managerial career and you being a pitching coach. Mm -hmm. You caught some heat on the plane, did just a, just a little, yeah, Lemmer in particular. But they all agreed with my choice for strength and conditioning, Coach Peter and Mary. I turned you down. You didn't have a choice. I yes, tried, I did. I tried to explain that to you. No, no. I refuse to be your pitcher. My way or the highway when I take over? I'll take the highway. You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> they couldn't find a uniform to fit me, so I guess I'll stay up here. Pop foul back and out of play. You'd take that job, though. You'd do it just to stay out of the open. Yeah, that's right. No meetings. That's what I told the players. That's got them on my side. I said, we'd have absolutely no meetings. You know what to do. I know Go they do like it. that. I know they also liked your loosening up program, too. Yeah. We might not win much, but we would really be entertaining. One and two, the count. Blouser leads. Upstairs to Lofton. Knocked him off the plate a little bit. Two and two. 
Speaking of Pete, he and Joe Simpson will be along at the end of this half inning to bring you the rest of the way. Now there, you say throw to first, the runner standing on the bag. That time the runner actually was. See, that's you've got your bag made up. You're going to throw over there, and that's that's really not really having a sense of what's going on. But more and more as a pitcher, you don't have to have a sense of what's going on. The throw over the step off is called for you. Sharply hit, but right out the second baseman. Fry throws him out, and the inning comes to a close. No hits, no runs, no errors. One left. At the end of four and a half, you score. Braves one, Red Sox nothing. Nice night for baseball, a one nothing Braves lead. And not too often you see pitchers battles in this ballpark, but we've got one going here tonight. Bottom third of the order for the Red Sox, which was a problem for Smoltz back in the third inning. Scott Hatterberg takes a strike leading off. He walked, Benjamin singled. Later, the Red Sox had the bases loaded with one out, but didn't score. One and one to Hatterberg. Hitting 273. John trying to come out of that good looking unit. <laughs> Got extra buttons on that one than what he's used to. Mm -hmm. A little different collar on that one, too. Fastball high, two and one. You know, you get used to your uniform being fairly snug as players like to wear them these days. And then you're playing one of these blousey things. It takes a little getting used to. Yeah, it would. And uh, even though th these are authentic replicas of the 1912 Brave uniform and the 1908 Red Sox uniform, there's one thing different about them. They have numbers. There were no numbers on the uniforms back then. Two and two. And that, of course, was a real problem for television broadcasters <laughs> in those days. Yeah. John may need to uh, get a safety pin for that thing. And he's asking for Jeff Porter's help. Jeff may have to come out and relace his shirt. <laughs> well, we've seen him relace a glove before, but I don't know if he's got the uh, necessary tools down in the dugout to take care of a shirt. He probably does. Well, get some tape. <laughs> yeah. One of the things, you know, they wanted the teams to wear these uniforms two or three days in this series. The Braves said, no, thank you. One day was enough. Yeah, and I don't blame one, them. One day, is, and I think that's right, because, uh, number one, you want the uh, the fans here in Boston when they come out to see the Atlanta Braves play, see the Atlanta Braves in, the, in their current uniforms play at least once or twice in this series. You don't want to have them in these old uniforms for the whole three games. Do you understand why they do this, Pete? Uh, just for a change. I mean, I, I understand it's it's a little bit of an exhibition look to it, though, to me. I, I don't understand in the championship season why they do this as often as they do. I know the Braves are coming back to their home where they started, but uh, players, not all that crazy about it, I can tell you that. Although they, they do look a little different in that blousey look. Yes, and, they do. And hard to identify when they're just walking around in the field, not at their position. Well, let's try that again. It's two and two. Got him. On the outside corner, Hanneberg can't believe it. Strikeout number six for John and his 201st strikeout of the year. Well, throughout the night, Brian Honora has had a very liberal strike zone. And if anything, Hatterberg might have argued that pitch might have been a little high, but we have heard that that gets called a lot more over in the American League than we see from National League umpires. That high strike. Yeah, that did look high. I agree with him. Mike Benjamin hit a rocket to center field for a base hit his first time up. Former National Leaguer. A little late on that one, though, and it's one and one. The one one pitch hit hard again, but Blauser made the play. He caught it in the air. He's making the throw anyway, but the third base umpire, Martin Foster, called him out as he was able to glove it before it hit the dirt. Nice play. Very nice play by Blauser. 
And just to be on the safe side, rather than looking around for the umpire to see what the call was, he went ahead and made the throw the on the first, fielder. even though it wasn't necessary. Aaron Third base Bray. umpire Martin Foster making the call that Blouser caught it in the air, and he did. Just made about three good plays tonight. Had a tough one hopper hit at him earlier in the ball game, and then crashed into Lockhart and made a good catch on a pop up. Darren Bragg, the batter, struck out his first time. Nine homers, 52 RBIs. 2 0. Oh. This particular go round of interleague play this weekend, 10 American League teams are at home, so the American League, who supplies the umpires, for the uh, home games had to call up a whole bunch of young umpires from the minor leagues and rearrange a lot of the crews to get 10 full crews out there working. Hit hard to center, but Lofton had him played perfectly and is there for the catch. And a one, two, three inning for John Smoltz. He's set down eight in a row. And we played five, one nothing Atlanta. Super Weekend on the Superstation. Friday, dinner at a movie. Molly Ring. Game Fred McGriff's solo homer. That came back in the second inning, and John Smoltz has become the first Brave ever to have four 200 strikeout seasons. And Keith Lockhart will lead off the sixth inning. He'll be followed by Chipper Jones and Fred McGriff. John had been tied with a couple of guys who had recorded three 200 strikeout seasons, but they did it almost 100 years apart. Lockhart slashes one in the hole for a base hit to start the sixth inning. Garcia Parra has played him up the middle his first couple of at bats, and Keith takes advantage of a big hole on the left side. Number 10. Jim number Whitney had three 200 Joe. strikeout seasons back in the 1880s. Phil Necro did it in the 1970s. Chipper Jones is 0 for 2. He's hit a hot shot to first base that Mo Vaughn made a nice play on, and he has fly to center, deep center. Sends a fly ball to left, down into the corner. Cordero into the wall, but can't make the play, and it's a foul ball. And that's hard to do, hit a foul ball down there. There's only about three feet of foul territory. Not much given that wall, either. And you can see how tentative Cordero was as he got toward that wall, even though it is padded over there. You still don't have a whole lot of room to work with over there in that corner. Keith Lockhart taking off anyway in case it was ruled fair. And the hard part, is, even if you know the wall is bearing down on you, Pete, when you stick your arm out there, you risk injuring a hand, wrist, elbow, dislocating a shoulder, and that's why he was a little tentative reaching all the way for it. Oh, and two. Got that one right by him. Chipper came into the game hitting 244 over his last 10 games. No homer, seven RBIs. One and two. I was talking to Greg Maddox on the bus last night, Pete. He's not pitching in this series. He said, but you know what? I'd like to. I'd like to say that I'd given up one over the Green Monster. <laughs> Change Changeup, rip to center. Bragg staggered a little bit, but he makes the catch. Chipper's hit the ball hard three times. He's got an over. And the batter is Fred McGriff, who has homered and grounded out. And the home run came leading off the second inning, and he crushed the ball right down the right field line. It's deep to right field. Once you get uh, past the foul pole, it goes out very quickly to about 380. And Fred hit it about 395, 400 feet out there. Good to see him turn on a ball. Get it right down the line. It's only 301, but it juts out to about 380 in a, in a hurry. Kind of enjoyed hitting here, too, had not 406 average. Make it 40-something. 40 Lockhart's going to take third. Fred with his second hit of the night. O'Leary got on it quickly, but Keith Lockhart got a good jump. Runners at the corners and one out. Number 18, the left fielder, Ryan 
Fred with two balls that he has hit with authority to, to the right. right side. Yeah, to right. That's the first time he's done that in a long time. And Klesko with a double tonight that he hit off the left center field wall. So back-to-back -back nights that he has driven the ball well to the opposite field. Atlanta with a chance to add to their lead. It's 1-0. Out of play and over the roof. Oh, it's coming back. Crowd here at Fenway Park, very much like at Turner Field, very close to the action right around the home plate area. You've got to be heads up. A bluff by Seeley, but Mo Vaughn's not even holding Fred McGriff on at first base with Plesko up there. Joe Hudson, a right-hander, begins to loosen up in the Red Sox bullpen. Missed inside, one and one. Jimmy Williams saying before the game he might have to play a little differently with his pitching staff in this series, knowing how good the Braves' starting pitching is. You just can't get yourself in too big a hole no matter how good an offensive team you've got. Most nights against American League teams, you'd never see the bullpen up this early in a one to nothing game. I know there were some scenes shown earlier tonight here on the Superstation of Jimmy Williams being greeted by some of his former players. That was really nice to see. He was surrounded at one point. Change up. Ryan went after it, fouled it back one and two. Well, he was extremely highly thought of on this ball club, not only for his ability as the third base coach and setting the defense, but for his instructional help. Yeah. He was one of the hardest working coaches you ever want to see in a ball club, working with infielders and outfielders. He has the Red Sox playing 500 baseball right now. The one two pitch just missed two and two. What do you think Pete. Well he didn't get the call on this one. We've seen that one go both ways tonight. A little wide. Pitch totals just about the same. Hit hard and over the head of Garcia Parra. That'll go to the gap. One run is in. McGriff headed to third. Lesko will have another double. Fred stops at third. Two to nothing Atlanta on Ryan Lesko's second double of the night. And again, he hit the ball with authority to left center field. And that is great to see. Yeah, during the long slump that Lesko was in, almost everything he hit was either popped up or grounded weakly to the right side. Number 25. But the last two nights, he hit the home run to left center field Andrew last night. Jones. And now a pair of doubles, both to left center field in this game. One of them high off the wall, this one bouncing off the wall. But he's leveling off that swing. Not much of an uppercut to that swing anymore, and that's good news for the Braves, and that's the end of the night for Aaron Seeley. 68 RBIs for Ryan on the air as Jimmy Williams makes his way to the mound. Joe Hudson's going to get the call because Jimmy Williams just made the Bell South call to the bullpen. Dear day, when I saw Wendy's Smoky Bacon Cheeseburger was back, I said, that sounds good to me. So I got him for the whole firehouse. So Two nothing Atlanta. We're in the top half of the sixth inning, and this weekend TNT kicks off its eighth season of NFL coverage with the Pro Football Tonight NFL Preview Show. That'll be at 8 Eastern time tomorrow night. Then on Sunday, the games begin. The Washington Redskins face the Carolina Panthers. Coverage begins at 7 Eastern time with the Pro Football Tonight pregame show, followed by kickoff at 8 o'clock. That's all coming up this weekend on the NFL on TNT. Well, the new pitcher for the Red Sox is right-hander Joe Hudson, and you see some pretty good numbers from him in his 19 appearances for Jimmy Williams. 30 innings, 25 hits, only 12 walks, and 13 strikeouts. Only getting 231 against him. 26 years old. He turns 27 next month. 6'1", 180 out of Philadelphia and West Virginia University. Harris runners at second and third one out and Andrew Jones will be the batter struck out in the second inning grounded the third and the fourth the infield comes in 
again Jimmy Williams knows he can't give up too many runs with John Smoltz out there and will try to cut off the runner at the plate if it's a ground ball. One and oh. Javi Lopez on deck. Fastball up the middle. Garcia Parra can't get it. A run will score. Plesko gets to third. He'll round third and stop. It looked like Bobby Dews was waving him home, but he stopped him. And there will be runners at the corners. And another RBI for Andrew Jones, his 55th of the year. And the Braves are on top three to nothing. One of the few times you'll see Garcia Parra get kind of a late jump on the ball. Ball wasn't hit that sharply. And he has terrific range, but he got just a little bit of a late jump Number on it. His diving try the came catcher, up short. Javi Lopez. I'm not sure, but it looked like the ball might have hit something, too, that caused a funny hop on him. But runners at the corners for Javi. As Plesko moves over to third. Lopez hit a comebacker to the mound, grounded to third. Andrew with 17 stolen bases gets some attention. One of the things you'll see center fielders do here, Pete, and they're doing it with Javi, as he takes up and in, is because the wall plays such a big part in left and all the way over to left center you rarely see a center fielder play a right handed batter to pull you got to protect that big corner out there that's 420 knowing that anything that's hit on a line and the gap's going to come back to you sharply as the ball Fusco hit did earlier tonight big swing but he foul tipped it one and one and yeah, this is a ballpark where the ballpark dictates your defense as mm -hmm. much as the hitters do right that monster, green monster out in left field, and all that room, as you said, out in right center. Well, and the right fielder you see there, too, sometimes you can be lured into a too deep a position in right field. You turn around, you look behind you, and it's a mile back to that bullpen fence, and you have a tendency to want to back up. High, two and one. I always was told and tried when I was in right field to kind of line myself up with the foul pole. If I was about straight across from the foul pole in right field I knew I was yeah, that's, three, right that's 300 feet 301 mm -hmm. feet down to where the foul pole is Andrew back to first another left-hander around my hay up now in the Red Sox pen Taste a bad pitch. Two and two. Javi with three homers and seven RBIs in his last ten games. Two big ones. In that series against the Astros. Plesko at third, Andrew at first. Another bluff. And Andrew didn't bluff. He didn't even go back to the bag. And he has to now. Braves on top, three to nothing, with a two spot on the board here in the sixth. The two-two pitch, up and in, full count. Keep an eye on Andrew. He might be running here with one out. Payoff hey, pitch. There goes Andrew. Pitch has popped up into shallow center field. Bragg on the run. Still coming. He makes the catch. Andrew. Has to hurry back to first, but nobody is there to cover first base, so no throw made. Mo Vaughn had lined up to be the cutoff man. 
two down. Nice long run for Bragg. He makes the catch and then had to play at first base. But he had to wait for somebody to get over there. By the time Hudson did, there was no time to get Andrew. And Greg Colburn, the batter, he's grounded out twice. There goes Andrew again. The ball gets away from Hatterberg. Plesko starts to the plate, now stops. I think Ryan picked that up a little late, and from his vantage point, he couldn't see how far it had skipped away from Hatterberg. It'll still go as a stolen base for Andrew Jones, who was running on the pitch. And that gives Andrew 18 steals now in the year. And here's Plesko. The ball gets away. He was breaking back toward the bag at third. Now he starts home. Not sure exactly where the ball is. Now he's better play it safe. You like to have your momentum going toward the plate, but even if he had that time, that one would have been hard to see how far it had gone away. So two runners in scoring position. And the 1-0 pitch to Colburn. Inside 2-0. The Red Sox, number one in hitting in the league at 299 in the American League. Second in runs scored, fourth in homers. Off his foot foul, two and one. But 11th in pitching and tied for last in defense. Now you've got the classic matchup in this series. The Red Sox, the best hitting team in baseball this year, and the Braves are the best pitching in baseball this year. So what stops what? Jim Rice, the hitting coach for the Red Sox. He wasn't too shabby in this ballpark. Saw him break a bat in a home run once or twice. Very, very strong man. 2 1 pitch. Called strike on the inside corner. Colburn didn't like it. 2 and 2. See where the target is set up. He missed the target, which was set up on the outside corner, about the inside corner. Up the middle base hit. That ought to score two. Klesko scores easily. Andrew Jones waves home. A two-run single for Greg Colbrin. His second and third RBIs as an Atlanta Brave. And it's five to nothing. This time he got it where Hatterberg wanted it. Where Colbrin was looking for it out there. Hits it right back up the middle. And it's a four-run inning now for Atlanta and a five-nothing lead. And Jeff Blauser, the batter, batting ninth in the order tonight. And Colburn at first. If the Braves wrap this division up with a few days to go in the season, Bobby's going to have to hit cleanup, hit Blauser in the cleanup spot just once before the season's over. That's the only spot in batting order he hasn't hit in now this year. And he could do it quite easily. Takes a strike on one. Jeff tonight, 0 for 1 with a walk. Everywhere but fourth. One and one to count. There are some of the players tonight that are fun to look at in these uniforms. They look like throwbacks to the old days. Drill to left center field. That's going to catch the green monster. Colburn was on the run. He rounds third. The 